This is lecture 20 for biology 177 on introduction to the nervous system. Now the nervous system is the central processing unit of the body. It pr processes sensory input and determines motor and visceral output. It often works hand in hand with the endocrine system, which we're gonna talk about in biology 178 to give rise to the term, the neuroendocrine system. The nervous system itself functions for rapid, but generally short-lived responses, whereas the endocrine system causes more long-term changes in function. The nervous system itself serves three major functions, sensory, integration, and then output. And it is divided into two anatomical divisions. The first is the central nervous system. Now the central nervous system is the integration and processing center that's gonna process all of the sensory information, everything that you feel, everything that you see, smell, etc., all the internal information from the body, the central nervous system will process and then issue out output commands that we would call motor commands. The central nervous system consists of the brain, cranial nerves, and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is everything that extends off of the central nervous system. This is really more relay system as far as having different sorts of connections that take in sensory information and output motor information. From the anatomical breakdown of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, we will divide the peripheral nervous system out into a few other branches. The first branch is going to be the sensory division and the motor division. The sensory division is entirely designed to bring information towards the central nervous system. It does this via sensory receptors. Sensory endings of nerves to detect changes in the internal and external environment and communicate via the afferent division, that's A afferent. There is the somatic sensory receptors, special sensory, and visceral sensory. Somatic, remember, is going to mean body. So somatic refers to position, touch, pressure, pain, temperature. We tend to be a lot more consciously aware of somatic sensory receptors. I want to go down to visceral sensory receptors next, and this contrasts with somatic being that it is the internal organs. It's gonna be things that you might not even be aware of. The distension of your stomach, uh, blood pressure increases, the overall chemical composition of your blood. These are going to be visceral sensory receptors that are always working, but you're just not aware of them. The final category in the center there is special sensory receptors. These are gonna to refer to smell, taste, vision, balance, and hearing. Now, we tend to be very aware of these, so they are similar to somatic, but they use very special sensory receptors that are unique to these uh, senses. So that way they exist nowhere else in the body. And so we have our own special category for those. Here we can see that breakdown division of the peripheral nervous system in this nice flow chart. We have the somatic, visceral, and special sensory, and that's going to transmit the information via the sensory division of the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system the brain and the spinal cord for processing. Now, once it's been processed in the brain and spinal cord, we then are going to issue motor commands. This is the other division of the peripheral nervous system. The motor division carries motor commands from the central nervous system to one of two divisions, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Now, the somatic nervous system, there's that word again, somatic body. It's going to be something that we're very keenly aware of, in this case, skeletal muscles. So it could be an action of we visually see a bee coming at us. We process bee coming at us. We then send out a motor command, run away or SWAT B, and we engage the skeletal muscles in this action. In the autonomic nervous system division, you can think of autonomic meaning automatic. This means it's going to use the smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, glands, and adipose tissue, the stuff that we don't think about that is automatically controlled. Now, here we can see that flow chart again, now that it's completed. This is going to illustrate the primary functions of the nervous system. It intakes information via sensory division of the peripheral nervous system, moves to the central nervous system for imp information processing, and then outputs through the motor division. The sensory division is also called the afferent division, A. The motor division is known as the efferent division, E. A good way to help remember this is motor can mean E for engine or E for exit, being that the motor division is always exiting the actual central nervous system. 
So the motor division of the peripheral nervous system is going to then branch off into the somatic nervous system, which activates skeletal muscles, and the autonomic nervous system, which is actually going to branch down into two divisions that we haven't talked about yet, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, but we'll talk about those later when we get to 178. But the autonomic nervous system in general is gonna activate smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, and adipose tissue to initiate an efferent response. Now that we've covered the structural organization of the nervous system, we can talk about the cells of the nervous system. The nervous system is composed of two types of cells. Neurons, which are known as nerve cells, and their function is to conduct electrical signals, and glial cells, which are support cells that support the neurons in uh, performing their function. Here we can see a typical neuron. The neuron is going to intake information via the dendrites, which are stimulated by environmental changes or the activities of other cells. It transfers that information electrically via the cell body and then out through the axon. The axon is an extended process that comes out of the cell and branches its way towards another cell. It ends in the telodendria and then the terminal boutons. The terminal boutons affect another neuron or affect or organ, so they're essentially sending the signal towards that cell. Now, the neuron itself is composed of dendrites, which receive stimuli from the environment or from other neurons. The cell body, otherwise known as the soma, which contains the nucleus, as well as other organelles, including mitochondria, ribosomes, etc. And then there's the axon, which includes the axon hillock region. The axon hillock is simply the initial segment where the action potential is generated and the process extends off of the cell body. The axon itself is designed to carry information towards other cells and away from the main cell body. It ends in the telodendria and synaptic bulbs where branches of the axon extend to the effector cells and then synapse with them. Where two neurons meet up is a synapse. Here we can see a representative synapse of the telodendrion of the presynaptic cell as it reaches down towards the actual cell membrane of another neuron. At the actual end, there's going to be neurotransmitters packaged in synaptic vesicles. Now this should look very similar to the events of the neuromuscular junction from section three when we talked about the muscle contraction. So it's gonna happen very much the same way here in that as the action potential travels down, it's going to open up voltage-gated calcium channels, allowing the calcium to flow in and move the synaptic vesicles filled with neurotransmitter to move through exocytosis and diffusion across the membrane to the postsynaptic membrane. When it's the presynaptic membrane, we have the information that's coming down the presynaptic and then it goes towards the postsynaptic membrane. So that way we can actually differentiate those two. Where they meet, again, they're not touching, but they're very close. This is called a synaptic cleft. And the entire structure of one presynaptic and one postsynaptic neuron meeting at the synaptic cleft is called a synapse. To review the synapse terminology, the synapse itself is a specialized site of communication between the neuron and another cell. The presynaptic cell comes before the cleft, and it usually contains synaptic vesicles packed with neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters are going to vary depending upon where it is throughout the nervous system. In a lot of cases, it can be acidiocholine, but it may not always be. Synaptic cleft is simply the space that actually separates the pre- and postsynaptic membranes. Then we move to the postsynaptic cell. This is after the synaptic cleft and the postsynaptic membrane has, is the location of receptors for neurotransmitters. Next, we're gonna talk about the structural classification of neurons. So we've looked at, if you can see the very end there, the multipolar neuron. We've used the multipolar neuron as kind of the framework for what a neuron looks like. And the multipolar neuron is the most common throughout and most neurons are of this type but there are three other types of neuron classifications. I'm actually gonna start with the multipolar neuron and its description. The multipolar neuron has several dendrites that connect to the cell body in one axon that extends off of it, but this may branch into multiple axons or telodendria that branch off. Now, most neurons are of this type, including motor neurons that control skeletal muscle. So that's the multipolar neuron. We're now gonna to move to the anaxonic neuron. The anaxonic neuron 
has more than two cellular processes. Notice from this picture, you can't really distinguish which is the axon and which is the dendrites. And so I'm not going to ask you to identify those either on a test. But that's one of the key distinguishing features of the anaxonic neuron is you can't tell which end is which. They are only found in the central nervous system in special senses. They are typically going to be interneurons to where they're actually going to be relaying information from one neuron, a sensory, to another neuron, motor. The bipolar neuron has two processes, an axon and a dendrite separated by the cell body. Now these are very rare and they relay information typically from special senses. They're involved in sight, smell, and hearing. The pseudo unipolar neuron, sometimes just called unipolar neuron, has a single axonal process with a cell body to the side. The sensory neurons in the peripheral nervous system are typically of this type. So reviewing the four major anatomical classes of neurons, the anaxonic neurons are small neurons lacking distinguishing features. They're typically located in the brain and in the special sense organs, and their functions are poorly understood, but we do see them in the cases of interneurons, where they kind of act as a translator between sensory and motor. Bipolar neurons have two distinct processes, one dendratic and one axonic, and they are very rare. They are typically only found in the special sense organs as discussed, sight, smell, and hearing. They are also very small, less than 30 micrometers in length. Unipolar neurons have the single cell body with a process that extends off, and the dendrites and axons are fused. Most sensory neurons in the peripheral nervous system are unipolar, and the axons are very, very long. They may extend up to a meter or more. The longest of these is going to carry sensory information from the tips of the toes to the spinal cord. So you actually have an axon that's going to extend the entire length of your leg. Multipolar neurons have two or more dendrites and single axons. This is going to be the very common one that we usually see when we see a diagram of a neuron. It's the mo and that's because it is the most common neuron in the central nervous system, and all motor neurons that control skeletal muscles are of this type. It can be just as long as the unipolar neuron being that the longest one actually carries information from the spinal cord the entire length of your leg and goes over to the small muscles of the toes. So very, very long. So besides structural classification of neurons, how they look, we have functional classification of neurons, what they do. Those are gonna be sensory, motor, and interneuron. Now sensory we're already kind of comfortable with. Sensory means it's gonna send information from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. We have of course somatic sensory and visceral sensory. We additionally have the special sensory as well, but that's typically gonna file itself under the somatic sensory division. Now, there are unipolar neurons with cell bodies that are found outside of the central nervous system, and these function to conduct sensory information from distinct receptors to the central nervous system via long afferent fibers or axons. So that's an example of it, is simply these long sensory neurons throughout our body that are gonna detect this information. The next classification is motor neurons. Motor neurons send information from the central nervous system to the periphery. An example here could be a multipolar neuron that carries efferent signals to stimulate, modify the activity of the peripheral tissues, organs, or organ systems, or just to contract a muscle. The final category is gonna be an interneuron. Now these are situated between the motor and sensory neurons. They analyze sensory input and coordinate motor output. So they're a translator or relay station. And they can be excitatory, where they turn things on, or inhibitory, where they turn things off. Now, they are responsible for analysis and coordination of the signals, but one of the main things that's interesting about them is that they only need to be used when the signals are a little different. So for an example is we have visual information coming in and a motor output coming out that's muscular. And in that case, you actually need an interneuron, but you don't always. A good example of not needing a motor neuron would be during the myotactic or knee jerk reflex, where somebody taps the tendon of your knee tendon and you kick. And in this case, we actually don't need an interneuron. Interneurons typically are going to be anaxonic neurons and found throughout the central nervous system and spinal cord. I don't know if you've eaten lunch yet, but 
in and out is sounding mighty good. You notice the middle hamburger right there. Oh, that looks like it's animal style. Mmm. Now that we've discussed neurons, we can look at the other type of cell that is in the nervous system, and that would be the glial cells, or neuroglia. These are cells that support and protect the neurons. There are some that are found in the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system, and they are abundant and diverse. They actually make up about half the volume of the nervous system, so there's quite a few of them. The breakdown of glial cells is going to be dependent upon whether it's central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. Now, the central nervous system has the most amount of glial cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia, and ependymial cells. This, the peripheral nervous system actually has satellite cells and Schwann cells. Here we can see a nice little flow chart breakdown of the differences between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. We're going to go through each one of the glial cells, including some of their functions, and then at the end, I'll go through a diagram illustrating some of the pictures of them. The first, and probably one of the most important ones in the central nervous system, is the astrocyte. The astrocyte serves the primary function of maintaining the blood-brain barrier. And we'll talk about this even more when we get to the protective layers of the brain. Now, the, bread, the function of the blood-brain barrier is going to be to isolate the central nervous system from chemicals and hormones in the blood. Additionally, the astrocyte is going to provide structural support within the neural tissue. It actually acts as like scaffolding between the different neurons, supporting the axons and how they branch towards one another. It's going to regulate ion, nutrient, and dissolved gas concentrations in interstitial fluid and around neurons. It's going to absorb and recycle neurotransmitters that are used from one neuron to another neuron. So remember that the presynaptic cell would release a lot of neurotransmitters and some of it would hit the postsynaptic membrane. Well, there's going to be some leftover, and in this case, that leftover neurotransmitter gets recycled by the astrocyte. And finally, the astrocyte forms scar tissue after a central nervous system injury to prevent it from infecting the overall system. Our next glial cell is a, an oligodendrocyte. These serve a similar function to Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. Oligodendrocytes are going to produce myelin. They also are going to provide the central nervous system framework by stabilizing axons, and they stabilize multiple axons together. Myelin itself is going to coat axons and help to increase the speed of neural impulses, action potentials. It does this via saltatory conduction. Now the axons covered in myelin make up what is called white matter. If they don't have myelin on it or they are a cell body, we call that gray matter. Now the cell processes wrap axons with layers of myelin and plasma membrane. We call this the myelin sheath. One oligodendrocyte can wrap several segments of axons. The microglia are the smallest of all central nervous system glial cells. They're looked up as the cleanup squad. They're going to migrate around the central nervous system and function as phagocytes. If we remember back from our first lecture series, phagocytes are going to be cell eaters. They're going to go around like Pac-Man and remove cellular debris, waste products, and pathogens. The final type of glial cell in the central nervous system that we will discuss is the ependymial cell. These are cuboidal or columnar cells with villi across them in cilia, and that they line the ventricles and canals throughout the brain and spinal cord. What they are going to do is to produce, circulate, and monitor a, comp a fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. So they're going to move this around. Now, the function, the general function of cerebral spinal fluid is to allow for the transfer of nutrients and the removal of waste. It's going to help to maintain the brain environment and to keep it floating. And the ependymial cells are simply going to be the maintainers and producers of this fluid. So here's actually a sample of all of the glial cells and the neurons and how they interact with one another in the central and then uh, throughout the central nervous system. And we can actually see a separation between the gray matter and the white matter. There you can see the astrocytes as they're supporting, creating scaffolding around the actual neurons and 
branching and separating a capillary. So you can see how they create the blood brain barrier there. You can see the oligodendrocyte as it's wrapping myelin sheaths around the axons to help with action, impulse, uh, action potential conduction. You can see the ependymial cells on the far left side as uh, it's lining an overall fluid filled cavity. And you can also see floating in the middle there, the microglial cell as it floats along with its kind of little feather like protrusions and acts as a phagocyte. In the peripheral nervous system, we have two types of glial cells, Schwann cells and satellite cells. Satellite cells surround peripheral bodies and are going to regulate the environment around neurons. So they're basically the astrocytes of the central nervous system. Schwann cells are going to be like the oligodendrocytes of the peripheral nervous system. They're going to cover both myelinated and unmyelinated axons. So they produce myelin and wrap around there. They also participate in axon repair. Here we can actually see a multipolar neuron in a peripheral nervous system and how it branches the axon down. The Schwann cell is actually going to be wrapped up and covered in its own myelin as it extends down. We can see here the process of how that Schwann cell nucleus is going to hug its way around the axon and keep wrapping over on top of itself as it creates the myelin sheath. It's like a jelly roll as it keeps rolling around itself and forming that myelin sheath. Now, most neurons lack centrioles in the central nervous system, so they cannot divide. So that means that if we get our nervous, uh, our neurons and our central nervous system damaged or we have disease that destroys them, they do not get replaced. Um, some neural stem cells do exist in the central nervous system, but most are inactive. There are a few small exceptions, and those are the epithelium that is responsible for the sense of smell. This gets replaced on a regular basis. The retina of the eye gets kind of bleached out and replaced. And then finally, we have the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that is involved in memory. Here we can actually see new neurons grow and develop because memories grow and develop as well. But overall, the central nervous system doesn't really see a lot of repair that happens. Now, this is due to a few different reasons on why we don't have uh, regeneration capabilities in the central nervous system. The first is that there's many more axons involved. There's a lot more connections. Uh, the second is that astrocytes are in there and astrocytes are going to produce scar tissue that can prevent axon growth in the damaged area. They also release chemicals that block axon regrowth. They really try to control the overall formatting of your central nervous system and pre prevent too much odd regrowth that could potentially result in damage. However, in the peripheral nervous system, we can regenerate neurons. Now, the axon and the myelon are going to degenerate distal to the injury, and then the entire process is going to begin from there. So this is, these are the four steps of neural regeneration in the peripheral nervous system. You will want to know them. The axon and myelon degenerate distal to the injury, and then Schwann cells are going to proliferate along the original axon path. They, so they kind of create a new pathway. Uh, during this time period, you'll also have little macrophages come in and kind of uh, gobble up all of the cellular debris, cleaning things up. The axon will then grow along the path created by the Schwann cells. From here, Schwann cells are going to wrap around the elongating axon. Now, if normal synaptic contacts are reestablished, you'll have normal function that gets regained. However, in some cases, the axon could grow in the wrong direction, uh, stop growing, and in that case, you don't have normal function return. So here's some of the steps as we go through. So step one, the distal axon degenerates and it's phagocytotized uh, by different macrophages where it's gobbled up. Step two, Schwann cells are going to multiply and create a cellular cord that follows the pathway of the original axon. And we can see that here. Macrophages are also going to come in during this time period and start cleaning up debris. Then we actually have the Schwann cells that release growth factor that causes the axon to regrow along its original path. Now, finally, what we have happen is 
the axon is going to finish growing and the Schwann cells are going to wrap around the elongating axon. Now, this type of repair works best in a simple cut injury where the proximal end of the damaged axon is adjacent or close to the Schwann cell cord. Crushing or tearing tends to cause the proximal end of the damaged axon to pull back, losing a connection to the original axonal pathway. In either case, it is not guaranteed that the newly grown axon will, one, establish the original synapse, or two, not wander off in another direction away from the tissue originally innervated. And this can result in odd nerve, nerve pain or nerve sensation or function if it regrows in the wrong direction. Now that we've covered some of the major structures and cells that make up the nervous system, we can actually talk about how these cells work and their overall function. And they actually function by producing electricity. So the question becomes, how does something organic produce electricity? This is actually accomplished through something called membrane potentials. Now to understand the basis of this electrical signaling, we have to understand the nature of biological electricity and membrane potentials. The membrane potential is an electrical charge across the membrane of every cell in your body. The creation of membrane potentials relies in large part of ions that are in your body, otherwise known as electrolytes. An ion is going to be a charged particle. We have positive ions known as cations like sodium, calcium, and potassium. And then we have anions, which are negatively charged ions. This is mostly chloride, but also includes the negatively charged proteins inside cells. This is abbreviated with a capital A and a negative sign. Now, cations and anions are gonna balance throughout the body, but not necessarily across a cell membrane. So the entire human body is balanced, but across a cell membrane, we tend to have a little bit of disequilibrium. And this is caused by the negative proteins inside of the cell. This creates a slightly more negative environment and helps to form the basis for our membrane potential. Now, moving forward, and before we move on to the next lecture, I wanna talk about a few general rules that will guide us as far as principles of electricity. It is important to remember that although atoms are generally neutral, ions result from one partner in an ionic compound stealing an electron from the other partner in the presence of water. So here, sodium chloride would disassociate and become a positive sodium plus a negative chloride. Now, the ionic charge, positive or negative, results in the generation of biological electricity. There are some guiding principles listed here to keep in mind as we explore the idea further. First, the net amount of electrical charge in the body must be zero. We call this the law of conservation of electrical charge. That means that every cation, positively charged ion in your body, must be matched with an anion, the negatively charged ion. Your body is electrically neutral because of this. The second principle, opposite charges are attracted to one another, whereas like charges repel one another. So positive and positive are actually going to attract, or excuse me, positive positive would repel, whereas positive negative would attract. Three, separating positive and negative charges requires energy. And that's gonna be important when understanding uh, how ATP and pumps function. Four, when separated, positive and negative charges can move freely towards one another and the material that they move through is called a conductor. If the separated charges cannot move together, the material that separates them is called an insulator. And that is where we'll finish with lecture 20. In lecture 21, we will talk about membrane potentials.